A big virtual hello to all of you from the San Francisco Bay Area. My name is Kyron Quasi. I am 11 years old, and this year I will be entering my third year of my undergraduate studies in mathematics and computer science. It is my dream to be an entrepreneur in artificial intelligence where I can work on platforms that actually use AI as a force for socioeconomic equity. I wish we were all together in Dublin, Ireland, but it's important that we stay safe and that we keep others safe as we work on bending the curve. One upside of the COVID-19 pandemic has been that science, data, and facts are important again right okay before i forget to mention this i do have a one-year algebra exam this morning so i won't be able to take live q a but you can find me on twitter and instagram if you have questions or if you know you want to offer me an internship cough cough so let's get started can civil liberties survive the era of artificial intelligence remember that quote just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they aren't after you? For the general public, the term artificial intelligence can evoke frightening images of super intelligent robots that will take over humanity, like this guy from the movie Terminator. Fun fact, there really is an international organization called the Campaign to Stop Killer Robots. I found them while doing some research. But in reality, who needs robots when you have algorithms? I think what should really frighten people is that most of the technology is actually invisible to most of us. And even though I'm seeing a lot of discussion in AI circles about developing ethical standards, I think that it's going to be challenging to do. And meanwhile, this technology is already silently changing life as we know it. Let's look at some of these recent headlines from the Washington Post. Police departments and prosecutors are now accessing personal devices and surveillance technology to track our activities. Fitbits, Ring doorbell cameras, even Alexa, they are all now part of law enforcement tools to help with their cases. And these are just a few instances of how AI-enabled technology is being used by law enforcement agencies. By the way, my mom says it's an exercise in cliche for me to mention George Orwell on that slide, but it totally fits, right? I mean, nowhere is the content of Big Brother more prevalent than the surveillance technology space. Here's a famous headline most of you will recognize. In a test run by the ACLU, they found that Amazon's facial recognition software misidentified 28 members of Congress as criminals after matching, or rather mismatching, their photos with mugshots from police databases. I know some of you may think this is funny because, you know, politicians, right? And it would be funny, except the ACLU has uncovered that the software has a race problem. It mostly misidentified minority members of Congress, including civil rights icon John Lewis. Yeah. And this type of technology is already being used every day in a way that disproportionately affects minority communities. I'm guessing you guys do this too, but I spend the first 30 minutes of every morning just reading headlines from the MIT Technology Review, CNN, and the Washington Post. And I'm finding the types of headlines that we saw on the previous slides are becoming more and more prevalent. That tells us that AI-enabled technology has become invasive and pervasive in pretty much every aspect of our lives. We can't escape it. And the increasing use of AI platforms by law enforcement and governments in general is raising serious issues for civil liberties, especially for populations that have faced historical systemic discrimination. And now, in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic, we are seeing the rapid expansion of surveillance technology by governments around the world. Purportedly to reduce community spread and protect public health. 
There was that viral video of China using talking drones and other mass surveillance tools to enforce its COVID-19 quarantines. Since then, mass surveillance has been deployed by countries such as Singapore, South Korea, Israel, and even certain U.S. cities to enforce quarantines. And just a few days ago, in the U.S., we learned that Apple and Google are teaming up to develop a COVID-19 contact tracing system to help governments and the healthcare agencies reduce community spread. So, what's the problem? The problem is that it's way too easy for governments to use our temporary panic to permanently expand their power to monitor our movements. More importantly, they can choose which populations to target for monitoring. Think about the effect of this power on criminal justice policies or on the ability of anti-government protesters and civil liberty groups to coordinate their activities. Also, we're not just talking about authoritarian regimes. Democratic governments like the U.S. are not immune to abusing their surveillance powers. If you read Edward Snowden's autobiography, Permanent Record, he offers an eye-opening revelation about the U.S. government's mass surveillance program and how the government has justified its extensive breach of our constitutional rights. There are pre three prevailing tools used by governments and especially law enforcement agencies. Facial recognition, predictive risk assessment models, and crime prevention software. Let's just briefly look at each of these three areas. First, facial recognition technology. This uses biometric technology to scan millions of faces from videos and photos. The scans are then transmitted to the cloud or secure data facility. Law enforcement institutions then may try to match these facial scans to databases of known criminals and suspects. All over the world, people are being scanned and tracked without their consent while conducting their normal everyday lives. Just in the U.S., the Government Accountability Office estimates that 640 million images have been scanned into the FBI's Facial Analysis Unit. The ubiquitous use of facial recognition software also raises serious concerns about fairness and justice by encouraging false arrests and potentially wrongful convictions on top of the disproportionate arrests of minority groups for equivalent crimes. The ACLU has asserted that this dystopian surveillance technology threatens to fundamentally alter our free society, even if the egregious accuracy issues did not exist. The second tool, predictive risk assessment models. In the U.S., these models are mainly used by prosecutors and judges for two purposes. First, to predict a recidivism score meaning the probability that a criminal defendant will re-offend. And second, to help decide the length and type of sentence given to a defendant. Kathy O'Neill wrote this bestseller called Weapons of Math Destruction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. I first read that when I was nine years old, and then again last year for one of my college courses. She writes that predictive risk models incorporate more than a hundred data points related to a defendant's history. These include the defendant's prior contacts with law enforcement, prior convictions, drug and alcohol use, and even the criminal history of their friends and relatives to decide what sentence should be for this particular crime. Think about that for a second. In our justice system, AI tools are being used to judge defendants partly by the actions of their friends and relatives. In 2016, ProPublica conducted a study of a widely used risk assessment model sold by the company Northpoint to courts and other justice system institutions across the U.S. The model, called Compass, predicts a convicted person's recidivism score. ProPublica's study found that, even after accounting for various factors, black defendants were twice as likely to receive misclassified higher recidivism scores than white defendants. 
Also, black defendants were 77% more likely to receive higher recidivism scores for violent crimes than white defendants. In the one example, a black woman scored a recidivism score of 8 out of 10 after she was arrested for stealing a bicycle. However, the same algorithmic tool gave a white male a recidivism score of 3 out of 10 after he attempted to commit an armed robbery. This is after he had already served 5 out of years in prison for a previous armed robbery. The severe disparity underscores the bias in AI algorithms that discriminate via race. In her book, Hello World, Being Human in the Age of Algorithms, mathematician and BBC presenter Hannah Fry discusses the complicated relationship between power, data, race, and justice. She asks the provocative philosophical question. If you were accused of a crime, who would you rather decide your sentence? A mathematically consistent algorithm incapable of empathy or a compassionate human judge prone to bias and error? Unfortunately, due to the systemic biases in both technology and human decision makers, I would argue that the privileged can answer either and the underprivileged should answer neither. This brings us to the third tool, crime prevention software. Such tools use existing crime patterns and historical data to predict where and when crimes are most likely to occur. Unlike facial recognition software and recidivism soft models that target individuals, crime prevention software targets geographies. However, Police departments tend to use the crime prevention software for both violent crimes and nuisance crimes, such as loitering and panhandling. Nuisance crimes are significantly more widespread in poor neighborhoods. This then leads to the over-policing of minority neighborhoods. Because more police officers are in the neighborhood, they will catch a higher percentage of offenses. This is then alerts the software to now send more police officers to that neighborhood. The overrepresentation of minorities in arrests and convictions, especially for petty crimes, then results in the loss of stability in family structures. Kathy O'Neill calls this the pernicious feedback loop that spawns new data, which justifies more policing and results in a system where geography becomes a proxy for race. So, what does this all mean? Besides the basic privacy issues of these AI-enabled technologies, we should be alarmed by the flaws in the methods, assumptions, and historical data used to develop these models. I hope it's okay to quote myself from a piece I published last year in the MIT Technology Review. Since predictive algorithms are based on finding patterns in historical data, skewed inputs generate skewed outputs. For example, since our criminal justice system has historically incarcerated minorities disproportionately for every category of crime, any predictive algorithms that law enforcement uses for criminal identification and recidivism patterns will only perpetuate this problem. In the way that it is being used currently, AI technology is reinforcing or even increasing systemic injustices against minority groups that are already overrepresented in our criminal justice system. AI tools are perpetuating the implicit and explicit biases that decide the fate of people in our system and further separating the application of justice and fairness between the privileged and the underprivileged. So, what should happen? Fortunately, numerous public and private groups around the world are becoming better informed of the implications of technology on our very definition of personhood, our human right to self-determination, fairness, justice, and privacy. In the U.S., the House of Representatives launched a bipartisan Artificial Intelligence Caucus in 2017 to study the economic and social impact of AI 
in the most important aspects of American life, including our privacy and civil rights. In October 2019, the ACLU announced that it is suing the FBI, the Department of Justice, and the Drug Enforcement Agency over secret surveillance tactics involving facial recognition technology. These are both important public and private sector efforts to balance our public safety needs against excessive intrusions on our civil liberties. I strongly believe that an international coalition of experts should be formed, maybe even under the direction of the United of the United Nations. They would be tasked to develop a human rights framework for the ethical and just application of AI technology. Otherwise, we will continue to see a deterioration of our sense of personhood. I would like to end here with a quote by Hannah Fry. It's about breaking open the algorithms and finding their limits, about separating the harm from the good and deciding what kind of a world we want to live in. Because the future doesn't just happen, we create it. Thank you so much for giving me this honor and platform. Please drop me a note on Twitter and Instagram. Goodbye for now.